Hello and welcome to The Arise interview. 60 minutes of big questions about the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insight and critical analysis. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next hour, if there is one celebrated Nigerian author whose profusely prolific writing has made millions of readers think and feel, opening their eyes to something new and bringing vivid images of another place and time to mind, it would have to be the late great novelist Cyprian Equensi. His literature has endured through time, ascending the ladder of the African classics and helping the people of the continent to evolve and grow through the power and grace of his words and storytelling abilities. Cyprian Equensi, the man who set new standards in African literature, coming up in a moment. Now, the gripping stories by Cyprian Equensi have inspired the imaginations of many, becoming foundational elements in Nigerian and African cultures, bringing to life characters that remain popular today, but also providing a glimpse into the customs and practices of Nigerian society at the time the books were written. His novel, People of the City, published in 1954, was one of the first Nigerian books to be published in the UK and to gain exceptional worldwide interest. It was also his first major work, appearing four years before Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart and paving the way for the international acclaim that would follow Achebe's masterpiece. Two wildly successful novellas, The Drummer Boy and The Passport of Malam Ilya, were published in 1960. Jaguar Nana came in 1961, gaining huge readership and winning Equensi the respected Dag Hammarskjöld Prize in Literature. It was followed also in 1961 by Burning Grass, a story about the nomadic lifestyle of the Fulanese. From 1961 to 1966, Equensi published at least one major work each year. Well, in a moment, we'll remember the life and works of the famous Nigerian novelist Cyprian Ekwensi through his son, George, and one of his close associates, Wale. But first, here's Cyprian Ekwensi speaking in 1965 about his writing and about Nigeria five years after independence. Of Nigeria is now five years old. Uh, did you take active part as a writer in the struggle to achieve independence for uh, your country? Uh, the kind of writing I do is quite different from uh, uh, what you might call nationalist writing. I'm a creative writer. I write novels mainly with a sociological theme. The people who took part in the struggle for independence were journalists. The, uh, I can think of one very good example. Our present president, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, was editor of the West African Pilot from 1937 when he returned from the United States right through the war years and uh, he only gave up journalism to enter politics. The kind of writing he did was protest writing, protest against colonialism, stimulating the people, awakening them to a, a sense of uh, their own rights and their own interests and their, uh, their self-realization. Uh, what part uh, do you think uh, a creative writer like yourself should play in present-day Nigeria, in, in the developing yes. time? Yes. A, a creative writer, I think, should be able to show the people to themselves. He should seek after truth. He should make the people see the truth about themselves. And in seeing this, they will then be able, uh, it is hoped, to look at themselves critically and adjust themselves. You have, of course, quite a number of illiterate people in Nigeria. Yes. And I presume you've had to use other media yes. to reach them. Yes. The most important means of communication in this country is the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 55 million people in this country. And it is reckoned that uh, the news, for instance, covers a listenership of about two to three millions. Uh, not only does this news go out in English, it goes into the main languages. There are three main languages in Nigeria, uh, Igbo, Hausa, and Yoruba. But within the regions, there are also regional languages. Uh, Radio Nigeria broadcasts in 22 languages out of the 250 in this country. So it is really the mass med uh, medium. Then there is the press, there is cinema, and there is television. Television is confined to the cities. 
Enugu, Kaduna, Ibadan, and Lagos. So those are the, the media. And you write for them all? Yes, I write for radio, I write for uh, film, I write for television, I write for all the media. Now, looking back now on five years of independence, yes. uh, in, uh, uh, in what matters are you satisfied with the development and uh, where are you disappointed? Well, I'm very satisfied w with the progress we are making in uh, raising the standard of living. Um, if you go through the country, you will find that the average Nigerian is living very, very much better than he was living many, many years ago before independence. Um, the jobs are being, the main jobs are being held by Nigerians. There is a very strong concentration of brain power in this country. In fact, Nigeria is beginning to export uh, experts uh, to other parts of uh, Africa and to other countries, educators and lawyers and so on. Um, that is where I feel extremely happy. What I would like to wish more is greater cultural uh, awakening and that now is coming mm -hmm. because this year we had a cultural festival in Britain, the Commonwealth Arts Festival, and next year we are going to have the festival of World Festival of Negro Arts mm -hmm. so that gradually the cultural aspect is becoming as important as the political aspect and this will be the strong unifying link throughout the generation. Wow, an era that's almost unrecognizable. That was uh, Cyprian Ekwensi speaking in 1965. Well, for more on the great Nigerian novelist Cyprian Ekwensi, I'm joined now in the studio by his son, George Ekwensi, who is the former chief risk officer at the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, Amcon, and currently chairman of the Cyprian Ekwensi Foundation, and by Wale Olaoye, chairman of Diametrics Limited, a PR company. He's also a columnist with Daily Trust newspaper and was a close associate of Cyprian Equency in his later years. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And just looking at that video, George, of your father speaking in 1965, is that someone that you recognize? I mean, you must have been a toddler. Yes. Well, not quite a toddler, but, but close <laughs> enough. <laughs> I was really a toddler then. But um, yes, I recognize that, and it appears that it's, it's as good as today. Mm. If you had continued that interview, he talked about politics in that, where people would look for a recourse if they had lost the election. And this was, of course, and 1965, 1965. And a year later, they had the military, military coup, coup, the first military coup in Nigeria. Quite correct. So it was quite prophetic in yes, many ways. Yes, very much so. And um, di you didn't know him at the time, Wale, did you? At, at that, I mean, you knew of him, most yeah. people, everybody in Nigeria, everybody in fact, knew. everybody in Africa, <laughs> indeed, many people in the UK yeah. knew about him, but you didn't know him personally at that point. No, I only met him in Drum, uh, in my day. Drum magazine, Drum magazine, which used to be a very popular yeah, magazine. And, and he used to be a columnist yes. in Drum. So it was like a small god, mm. you know, to aspiring reporters and stuff. But he, what endeared him to everybody was his total, total, total lack of airs. celebrity yeah. status yeah. That is kind true. of airs. I, I read about that quite uh -huh. a lot. He never had any airs. Oh, no. at all. So you start wondering, you say, are you sure? You know, there were two gods, mm. to put it that way. Uh, there was Cyprian Equesi, who was who will come in, write his column, go. And there was Nelson Otter, who was the resident god. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I like that. So there was the one, the god that came and went. And went. then there was, was the one, one that, that was, was permanently birthed <laughs> at the office. <laughs> so That's the god to worry about, the one who's permanently birthed. Well, eventually it turned out that uh, the two of them had quite a lot of influence hmm. on the lives of all those that passed through them. It's, it's not common for you to want to be like somebody. Mm. You could want to be a great writer, you want to be a great journalist and stuff, but when you see, uh, you know, virtues and uh, mm. traits in people uh, that in later life you find that they form who you eventually become, then you know how great those people really were. Mm. And of course, I mean, let's be clear, George, your, yes. your father was a legend. Um, what are your earliest memories of him? Um, 
because he was talking about you know the, the these gods that were walking in and out but I mean and the fact that he didn't have any heirs heirs you know but he expressed at one point the fact that he had difficulty writing in Africa. I mean, I remember him saying exactly, you know, that if you isolate yourself, the challenge he faced was that as a writer, you need solitude. And in the African context, if you isolate yourself, people start to think that, you know, they complain that you think you're, you're special or that you're something different and that you're kind of looking down your nose at them. So a lot of African writers tended to go to Europe. Right if they really wanted to write. Was that something you, you sort of that, noticed? That was something that he, he talked about most of the time. Mm. Uh, the James Baldwin, the um, George Orwell yes. type people that lived in the mountains. Mm, absolutely. Until the books came out. Mm. For instance, in this particular uh, book here, that's, that's a part of a lot that's of... Glittering the, City. Glittering City mm. is a part of a novel collection, a modern yes, Penguin yes. collection. Mm that includes all these people, mm. Martin Luther King, Yves Chinua Achebe, James Baldwin, mm. George Orwell, and so on. So he, he, he almost occasionally, based on, just like today, with the electricity mm. and all that whatnot, he'll, he'll get upset and say, I just I don't need anything. All I have to do is snatch my bag and I'm going to the United States. But of course, as if to emphasize that point that, that George is making, I mean, when he wrote Jaguar Nana, it's almost like every time he had the opportunity to be on his own, he wrote prolifically. I mean, when he wrote Jaguar Nana, it was written while he was studying broadcasting in Rothwell House in the UK, and he wrote the entire thing, according to him, in just 10 days. I mean, yeah. the first manuscript. I mean, that's, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for instance, there's a book called For a Roll of Parchment. Mm. In a Roll of Parchment, so he was going to the UK on a steamship to study pharmacy. Mm. Uh, before he got to the UK, at that time there was, you know, you gotta go by the um, steamboat. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. By the time he got to the UK, he has completed the whole novel for a roll of parchment because mm. that's what he was going for. Well, I mean, he did the same thing with people in the city. He mm. said he wrote it on a ship coming out to England mm, in yeah. 1951. Yeah. I mean, uh, amazing, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, they had 13 nights at sea between Apapa and Lagos. I mean, a papa in Lagos and Liverpool yeah. in, in the UK. And it was 13 uninterrupted days. And he couldn't believe what, how brilliant. I mean, it's like, my God, I don't have people knocking on my door, right. waking me up and all that sort of thing. And I can just stay on this vessel and write. And each one of those books became a literary masterpiece. And, and, and he wrote them in just 10 days and 13 days sort of respectively. The result of that was... Um, he was a forest officer mm. in Nigeria at the time. Well, let, let me not let you talk about that because we, we're, we're going to be going on a break in 10 seconds. Okay. So we'll come back and we'll talk about that. But that's another fascinating thing because yeah. he used that opportunity that led to, that discipline. To, to write quite a lot. Right. But stay with us. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the life and the works of the celebrated Nigerian author Cyprian Ekwensi. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagoro. And the theme of preserving African culture in the face of Western domination is what often gives voice to the characters in Cyprian Ekwensi's brilliantly readable novels. For observing, recording, and retelling the Nigerian experience from the perspective of various ethnic groups, Cyprian Ekwensi has become one of Africa's most recognizable and influential writers. In between stints as a teacher, forester, pharmacist, broadcaster, and filmmaker, Ekwensi published more than 40 books, as well as radio and television scripts. Today, we remember the legendary author and the incredible, long-lasting legacy he left behind. We'll hear some more from his son and his close associate in a moment. But first, here's the great Cyprian Ekwensi talking about life in Biafra and Nigeria at the end of the country's civil war in 1970. Yeah, Abbas is around. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, okay, okay, I'll be around, don't worry. 
Well, I hope you're enjoying your talk. Mr. Yes. Yes, My feelings are surprising, uh, surprisingly to me. They are, they are absolutely normal and uh, uh, happy. I am glad. I have always said that I wanted an end to the killing. You follow that? I always said that this killing has gone on enough. Nobody likes it. You know, my own brother is married to another Nigerian girl. She has three children for him. You follow that? As I have said also, I was born in northern Nigeria, educated in western Nigeria, and I come from here. You're happy to be back in the fold? I am absolutely happy. Are no trouble at all. Against the British? Uh, British, well, I still have to see them. They are my publishers. <laughs> <laughs> can we ask you, what is the situation here at the moment? Well, the situation, as far as I can see it, improves from day to day. Um, at the very first, there was a general uh, scramble away, and uh, gradually, from the way that the troops are behaving, people are gradually beginning to uh, have some confidence. Remarkable look back at history there. 1970, Cyprian Ekwensi speaking just after the end of the Nigerian Civil War. With me in the studio, his son, George Ekwensi, who is the former chief risk officer at the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, AMCON, and currently chairman of the Cyprian Ekwensi Foundation, and Wale Olaoye, chairman of Diametrics Limited, a PR company. He's also a columnist with Daily Trust newspaper and was a close associate of Cyprian Ekwensi in his later years. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you. Was there, Wally, let me start with you, um, a political element to his writing? Because he, he spoke in that clip there of, he came across as being politically neutral. Yeah. There was a sense that even though he operated in Biafra and, and was occupied a very prominent position, publicity and all of that, there seemed to be the sense that he felt that there was no justification for the number of people who had to die in order for the war to sort of continue for as long as it did. I couldn't have put it better myself. There was no justification, and that was the humanist in him. Mm. Uh, when you see the classification of various uh, literary icons, you will find that super equacy was classified as a humanist, and that is for a reason. Mm. It is the humanism that informs everything that he did. If you look at his novels based in the cities and his own life too, I don't think there was much that he wrote that he invented. Mm. He picked them from real life situations. Yes. And being somebody mm. like that, you will feel you say how many more people have to die before this rubbish stops. Mm. That was what informed his own position. And it, politically too, he was able to see the words in the faces of the various political personages to the extent that for every positive you could say of somebody, he could find you something that wasn't so positive. And then he would say, don't kill yourself for mm. anybody. You know, these guys are manning their corners, that he would rather stay in the middle so he can enjoy the benefit of, mm. you know, laughing at all of them. And yet, George, um, in spite of what Wally is saying, I mean, he was the head of publicity in Biafra. Yes. And therefore, one could argue that he helped through his propaganda to extend the life of Biafra and to keep those troops going back to face the bullets from Nigerian forces and to keep the hungry plodding along and, and the refugees still raising their fists, clenched fists, when yes. they see, you know, Emeko Juku driving past. I mean, is, is there some plausibility that, to that line of argument? That, that is quite true, because don't forget he resigned his position mm. um, as the indigenous, first indigenous director of the you know, Ministry of Information. Yes, that was in Nigeria, in Nigeria and, and returned, and, and to, returned Biafra, to Nigeria. Yeah. To Biafra. And, and returned to Biafra. And the likes of Uchi Chukun Merije mm. work with him. And as you pointed out, I was still a very young child, mm. but I was always around. And on one certain day, they were having lunch, and there was a question that came up. This was during the war. During the war. Right. And you're talking about the propaganda you mentioned. So they came up with a number mm. that 3 million people had been killed. So the whole world was shot. In other words, three million Biafrans, Biafrans been killed, right? Yes. So that's, that's a good machine. Which, of course, wasn't true. No, it wasn't. Yeah. So the characters international, they were, all those guys rushed into Biafra. 
I can remember one of his books, you know, Survive the Peace. We've survived the war now, are we going to survive mm. the peace? It was a scenario where everybody was saying, oh my God, how are you? You still alive? <laughs> everybody was recognizing everybody. <laughs> so what happened to the three million people? You're not, you're not one yeah, of them? Yeah, because I mean, yeah. the, the, the number of people in, in Biafra at the time couldn't have been much more than three million. Right, so, but everybody was like, was, right. like, was like, oh, you're still alive? Oh, I, what happened? Oh, okay, great. Everybody knew everybody. Mm. So where's the three million people? Well, let's get away from the Civil War for a, for, for, for a moment there and go back to you just as his son. I mean, you know, this was your father. To us, he's some legend, but to you, he, he's, he's your father. I mean, yes. when did you realize he was this famous, larger-than-life author who was revered, not just in Nigeria, but across Africa and the world? Well, when I was in primary school, mm. the drummer boy <clears throat> was one of the books we had to read. <laughs> I like that. So... <laughs> It's like, wait a minute, I recognize we were given, that name. We were given an assignment on the drummer boy. <laughs> and that weekend, I went out playing football. And right. Things. On Monday morning, we came in, and there was a question. And they said they, they had to go to me first. Of course, obviously, I did not read I mean, you didn't do I, your I didn't homework. Do, I didn't do my homework. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was published severely for that. And, and that's when I knew. And everybody recognized me. They knew who I was. And the story even went to my dad <laughs> that, that, what's going on? And was dad crushingly disappointed? He was crushingly disappointed, but it, it helped me also to become mm. a better student. Sure. And um, in t when, I mean, just going beyond that kind of, you know, youthful period to the fact that he had become this larger-than-life character. Would you say that Jaguar Nana was his magnus opus? I mean... Or was it Passport of Malam Ilya? I have to say, I'm prejudiced, so be careful what you say, which one you pick, because I know my favorite. I think he knows my favorite. <laughs> but perhaps even Burning Grass. I mean, which of his masterful works ticks all the boxes for you? I, would, uh, I was once at an interview where a journalist wanted to know which was his favorite of your, all his books. Don't forget people in the city, or yeah. people of the people city. Of the, yeah. Don't people forget the, the drummer city. boy. Yeah. Oh, African Nice Entertainment, so many yeah. of them. And uh, the, the guy wanted to know, and uh, he looked at the guy and he said, he said, you know, he said, how many children do you have? The guy said, three. He said, which one do you love most out of the three? <laughs> the guy said, I love them equally, they are my kids said, but this one is literature now. This is different. He said, it's the same. Mm. He said, I give birth to all those works. He said, I said, and I like each one for a different reason. At times, it's the circumstances in which I was writing it. Mm. At times, it was the three I got from writing it. At times, it's the returns. He said, so which area do you want me to talk about? Now, is it the money that came with it or the three I got from it mm. or the impact it made in society and that kind of thing? So if I was to answer this question, I would say each of his books brought something to the table. Right. For you. For me. Right. But, but in terms of a bestseller, would you say that it was probably Jaguar Nana? In terms that of... Are, that are sold... Because, it, I mean, it, it's, you know... It, I'll let George answer that question in a minute, but mm. just to get your, your take. My take on that, yeah. Jaguar Nana for its notoriety... Mm. And for the fact that uh, it also became a song, mm, don't, don't forget, yes, yes. Orlando Julius did a song, Jaguar Nana, and uh, we always had this joke with Chief, how much did they pay you, mm. and that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, Jaguar Nana made him, it was the first Nigerian novel to be discussed on the floor of the Nigerian parliament. Yes. Ah, people said, ah, this is too much, our kids shouldn't be reading They wanted this. to make a movie out of it. Right? Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, <laughs> let, let me just bring George <laughs> in, because I mean, it, it was, it was an not only was it very popular, very well written, it was very controversial. I mean, the Catholic Church was up in yeah, arms, the Anglican it. Church. Even yeah. in Ireland, they banned the book. The book yeah, they were banned in schools. Mm. But you say, Jaguanana, when you, we were talking about polit politics earlier, Jaguanana, my father was a pharmacist, as you pointed mm. out earlier. So he, told, he said that every pill is bitter. Every pill you take is mm. bitter. 
So he, he used Jaguanana to sugarcoat the actual story. Mm. So it was a satire. Yes, so it's not necessarily Jaguanana per se. Yes. It's a bitter pill that even affected politics. I understand, but, but the language that was used in it was what drew the ire of a lot of people. You see what I mean? The fact that it was very sexually explicit. It does that sugar coating. And it was a story of, of a prostitute, sure. basically. Yes. But, but a, a good-hearted prostitute. Yes. Um, and that was what made people think, oh my God, right. you know. Right. <laughs> but of course, it ended up winning one of the most prestigious awards right. in the world of literature right. in the world, right. a Dutch award. I think it was the D DAG, you know, Hammer School. Yes. Yeah, I mean, top award and I think that, that that might have reversed the impression and then led to even bigger sales. And, and that's a book that was also published by Penguin, yes. the first in their series in African modern classics. So you're, you're quite right. With well, that. we're going to talk about that republishing, but uh, I think we've got the we've got the cover anyway. But this is Jaguar Nana. Yeah, the latest um, cover. So so stay with us. We're going to talk a lot. I mean, this is just absolutely fascinating stuff. Uh, thank you for being here. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the legacy left behind by the great Nigerian novelist Cyprian Ekwemsi. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolo. Today we're discussing the life, the works, and the legacy of one of Africa's greatest and most recognizable writers, Cyprian Ekwensi, author of some of the continent's most famous books, including People of the City, Jaguar Nana, Passport of Malam Ilia, Drummer Boy, and Burning Grass, to mention a few. An ethnic Igbo from Anambra State, Ekwensi was born in Mina in present-day Niger State. His father was a famous elephant hunter and storyteller, which is said to be where the young Equency got some of its inspiration for creative writing. In school, as in life, Equency was brilliant and gregarious, attending government college in Baden and becoming engrossed in Yoruba culture. His school life and his multi-ethnic upbringing would be amply reflected in his many novels. Millions in Nigeria, Africa and across the world have been touched and influenced by the grace of his storytelling and the style of his authorship. Among them, arguably Nigeria's most famous international writer today, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Take a listen. I've been a reader for as long as, as I've been a writer. Really, both came at the same time for me. I mean, I've been writing since I was very, very young. Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie has quoted legendary literary icon C. Prine Ekwensi as a literary icon of all times. She mentioned reading many of the novelist's books. In her words, she said, We called the most stylish girl in my secondary school class, Jaguanana, after the novel by C. Prine Ekwensi, which was widely read and loved by us 15 years old. Its retelling of a folk tale and African night entertainment was part of our school curriculum, as was Burning Grass, what we preferred is less sedate urban novels such as Iska, People of the City, and Beautiful Feathers and Jaguanana. Ekwensi, who died in November 2007, was one of the legendary novelists who wrote during the post-independence era in Nigeria. That's just a little snippet there, uh, remembering uh, Cyprian Ekwensi and, of course, uh, Chimamande Ngozi Adichie, uh, noting him as one of her greatest sort of writers and people she appreciated and inspired her as well. With me in the studio, his son, George Ekwensi, who is the former chief risk officer at the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, AMCON, and currently chairman of the Cyprian Ekwensi Foundation, and Wale Olaoye, chairman of Diametrics Limited, a PR company. He's also a columnist with Daily Trust newspaper and was a close associate of Cyprian Ekwensi in his later years. Thank you for staying with us and and that inspiration of so many people i mean if you read the rest of that article because what we, what you saw there was just a tiny snippet i mean chimamanda adichie was raving about cyprian <laughs> and i have to say i agree with her because i rave about him i mean for me the passport of malam Ilya is a classic by any standards of writing anywhere in the world. And it lends itself, maybe because I'm somebody who loves, you know, television and film and that sort of thing. I mean, it just lends itself naturally to a film script. And what is astonishing is that it isn't yet a movie. 
You're, you're right. Um, it actually lends itself to. It's a, it's a natural script. Mm. It's a brilliant. The, the book. screenplay wouldn't be much. Um, is 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 magnetic. Mm. And and I think what what is particularly captivating about that book is the fact that there are historical elements in it that most Nigerians are unaware of. For example, there's, there is a stereotype in Nigeria that the northerners welcomed colonialism and that they, they were not really prepared to um, for independence or whatever. I mean, that, that's neither here nor there because that's right. a different political era. Mm -hmm. But the book records in 1903 the way that the North fought against colonialism. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and the incredible levels of political awareness that are manifested in that book. Absolutely remarkable work, but told in a very accessible manner. Not, right. not a right. sort of academic book, right. Right. but yeah. as a novel. It talks about the Northwest, the air mayor of Kirby, and, you know, yes, many, absolutely. and then Usman. That, that, that even mm. killed yes. uh, a British soldier. And also talked about terrorism. Oh, yes. The early days of terrorism, yes, yeah, a lot the of what we see in the North. Mm, Usman yeah. was the terror of the North. Yes, I mean, yes, extraordinary yes, book. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's um, and in terms of tragedy, you know, um, because, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about him being a chronicler, as it were, of sort of, the city life and, and Nigerian history, and, and in some ways, Passport of Malam Ilya, a historical record right. of the North's agitation against colonialism. Uh, but in terms of personal tragedy, um, he had his, his own share, didn't he? I mean, not only did he go through the Nigerian Civil War on the Biafran side, which would have exposed him to so much death and destruction, mm. um, I think one of your your brothers was killed yeah. um, in 1998 by soldiers around Onitsha right. in Anambra State. What, what happened? I, I, I was actually in the U.S. at the time, mm. and I don't know much about it, but Mr. Olaya was very much involved in, in what happened. Mm. But from what I recall, uh, he, he became friends with the military people, and based on what the old man knows, he, he warned him, mm. what are you doing with a, with a soldier as a friend? What are you doing with a soldier as a friend? It's not, you know, so one thing led to the other. I think a soldier got killed or something in that Onitsha area that you were talking about. And being a close associate of yes. that, they came in and, and, of course, you know, picked him up uh, to explain what he knew because he was always with him. Mm. One thing led to the other, and, and in the Nigerian words, accidental discharge or whatever they might call it and that was the end of him and they called it an accidental discharge yeah did you believe it was an accidental discharge <laughs> i don't believe so because they, they they when when he went to make a report um they were nonchalant i think the soldier was, what, what do you want your, your, your son is in the mortuary just like that how callous you know, so it was really a painful situation. Oh, I can imagine. And, and what was his, I mean, what was your assessment, Wally, of the way he reacted to that situation? <clears throat> Eventually, as, as always, he reacted philosophically mm. after reviewing, because, you know, he was somebody who could, he, he left his uh, argument hang out there. He, yes. He, he could ask you, what's the time now? And then he said, you know, you remember we've been on this for 30 minutes and all that. He's almost answering his own question. Mm. So when that thing happened, it really hit him. It hit him very, really hard. And then after when he returned from Enugu to Lagos and we sat talking about it, and all, then he became philosophical and uh, started sharing with us the fact that, uh, you know, when... Nobody knows when this thing is going to happen, but mm. when, when it's going to happen, it's going to happen whether you are 10 years old or 50 or 100 or whatever, but that the circumstances could have been less painful if the person had just slept and didn't wake up. And that, so I saw the way he was trying to come to terms with the fact that uh, a child of his was being buried in his lifetime. Mm. I, I mean, it will hurt any parent. And, but the, what... What, really, what I really took away from his reaction to it was that 
Uh, it helps when you have a philosophical mindset to things. It even helps your sanity. Uh, never once did I see him so in such a way that he had lost his mind mm. in grief, as many people would do. But he became calm. Then he tried to reason it out and to say, ah, oh, but yeah, almost as if I saw this coming, you know, mm. like that warning that George mm. was talking about. Because he shared that with me at the time, and I too put in a word. I said, look, <laughs> old people know what, they're, what they see sitting down. You won't see it even if you climb a tree. And, you know. So I had had an input at that time. But when it happened, the way he took it philosophically was, was incredible. Uh, eventually, he came to terms with it. But each time he remembered, if he cast his mind back, uh, he would say, let's talk about something else. Mm. You know? so that and of course, nine way. years later, this, was, this happened in 1998, yeah. was it? Nine years later, he was gone. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see him set against that tragedy, but also um, to fix his writing of fiction against the sort of hard economic and social reality of the country that he no longer probably recognized from what he knew, you know, full of spirit in the 19. 60s, a country where poverty and insecurity had become the order of the day, but also where educational standards were dropping and where escapist fiction, which is what he specialized in, suddenly became no longer that important to people. They, they wanted survivalist books, like motivational books right. and Christian books and, you know, that sort of thing. How did he cope with that in, in his later life? Well, you know, he, he always referred back to the, the earlier books mm. that captured what you're just talking about. Amanda did you mention Iska, mm. if, you recall, if you remember. Iska was about, about, about a story of what happened locally, mm. where there was a fight between the Christian and the Muslim, and people joined hands. Yes, and, and there were killings. They, they, they were and, killing for yeah. two weeks, riot. Yes. And, and but at the end of the day, nobody even asked what. See, that, that's the kind of stuff he captures. Mm. Nobody ever <laughs> asked, why are we rioting? Why, yeah. are, you why are we killing, killing each other? Yeah, but the guy is dressed like Except for you. the girl in the book who asked somebody, I mean, you're killing people, but the politicians you're killing on their behalf are sleeping in their beds, and you're under attack. Yeah. It's almost like mm. today. Yeah. Too, too. You know, so so it, it reflects to the question that you're asking. In the later years, it, it became very difficult. Instead of writing books like the what you saw over mm. there, you know, called Camp Boy, Saman and the Highway Robbers, which is also pretty interested. Mm. Someone called the highway robber, a guy was picked up. I think I've, I've heard, I've come across Right, I just saw it over there, and, yeah. then the, the, and, and then the police asked him, what is your name? He said he was Tunde. He had five different names. So, so the question was like, you're Tunde, you're Chike, you're uh, uh, Aliyu. What's that all about? He said, well, I don't, whatever I'm captured in the country, I give a different name. So people wouldn't know where I'm from <laughs> because I'm in Nigeria. Yeah. That kind of stuff. So he started writing those kind of So books. it's very interesting that hidden behind that was a sense that perhaps the, there is a major identity or lack of identity in this country. The, the, the Nigerian ness was always lost and subsumed within the ethnic. So right, mess. because, because if you're picked up in a, in a different clan, mm. the first thing is your identification. Mm. So you have to provide something to identify yourself. Absolutely. Just hold that thought. We'll come back in a minute. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the life and works of the celebrated Nigerian author, Cyprian Ekwensi. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Eniagulu. Today, we remember the brilliant and legendary Nigerian writer, Cyprian Ekwensi, who died in 2007 at the age of 86. His first book was published in 1947, and from then on, he concentrated on writing about the cultural fallout from the rapid urbanization of the new Nigeria. The city of Lagos featured prominently in many of his books, portrayed as a sort of dark thriller full of the restlessness, melodrama, 
and excitement of the metropolis with characters ranging from nasty landlords and women stripped naked in public to political violence, the prostitutes with a heart of gold and the seduction of powerful politicians. I mean, you couldn't get a better bird's eye view of the cultural and political scene in Nigeria in the 1950s and 60s, gloriously imagined by the brilliant Cyprian Equency and captured in his many books which were quite simply a joy to read. And with me in the studio, his son, George Equency, who is the former Chief Risk Officer of the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, Amcon, currently Chairman of the Cyprian Equency Foundation, and Wale Olaoye, Chairman of Diametrics Limited, a PR company. He's also a columnist with Daily Trust newspaper and was a close associate of Cyprian Equency in his later years. Thank you for staying with us. Um, he wrote for more than five decades, yes. um, which brought him a lot of fame. But did it also bring fortune? Was he a rich man? No. He, did, he didn't write for that. Oh, you're just he, trying to be modest, wrote, are you? He, he, no, he, he, <laughs> <laughs> he, wrote, he, wrote, he wrote for the fame. He once said that you will make a lot of money doing this. But you'd be famous enough, you could meet presidents, you could mm. meet uh, royalty, you could meet people around the world, which he did. But, um, but he did well. Mm. You know, um, but that's what he wanted. He wasn't complaining, he let's, wasn't let's complaining. put it that way. Yes. Um, I understand he had a writing room, which is always a beehive of sort of activity. And there were always complaints from his wife, who I, your mother, I assume. Um, that the room was untidy, and, but he would insist that it, it, it should be left that way because if they upset anything, they would upset his whole rhythm. Right. And he just would not be able to get it back again. <laughs> because he, he knew where everything was. Mm. You know, um, I mean, I think I even inherited that. I, I, I sleep sporadically mm. because he was always up at night, you know, just clicking over the typewriter. And, um, so there was a kind of order to the chaos. It's a, it's a great order to the chaos. There's, mm. There was a method to that. And I mean, just going beyond that into today, you, you've just republished um, a lot of his books. Tell us about that and tell us what's happening with the foundation, the Cyprian Equency Foundation. The Cyprian Equency Foundation uh, came into being after his death in 2007. Mm. I'm sure you're aware of the um, Cyprian Equestrian Center mm. for Art and yes. Culture yes. Um, in Area 10. Mm. That was commissioned by the then minister, Dr. Modibo. Mm. So that, that's, we've got it on the screen. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, we're working on that foundation, mm. and the foundation will do a lot in terms of continuing his legacy. He believed much in education, reading, right. getting the young ones to read. Uh, he always believed in the newsprint. Um, if he was alive today, I think he would stay far away from, he would still work on the computer, but he would like to handwrite yeah. his, his, his documents. He liked the stain of ink yeah, on his fingers, didn't he? Ink, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and so with that Stephen Equancy Foundation, a lot of things is going on based on the humanity that mm. he was talking about. Uh, I've gotten involved in a few foundations based on my upbringing and learning from him and mm. what we're going to liaise together with the foundation. We have one that will cater for the men and women in uniform and their widow. We have a current one that we're working with international organization called Neoterix mm. uh, that, that will train health workers in the six geopolitical zones, the 36 states, and move it into the primary health care and ultimately up mm. to the, to the uh, federal ministry. Well, it sounds very impressive. Yes. And I mean, ju just returning uh, Wally to his um, mode of or modus operandi, if you like, the way he lived. I mean, he, he always preferred to live among the people, didn't yeah. he? I mean, he, he could have lived wherever he wanted. He could have been very elitist. Mm. 
but he wasn't because the, the substance of what he did was the people, what he wrote about. And so in Lagos, for instance, I understand he, he preferred to live in the center of the city mm. because he wrote about the city and tended to see it better, more sharply because yeah. he sort of lived there. And all the noises would come in and would serve as inspiration for him. Uh -huh. Thank you for saying that because earlier, we were talking about a writer, you know, mm. needing some quiet and stuff. That wasn't the Cyprian Equency that I knew. The Cyprian Equency that I knew was a go-getter. Mm. Let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. His typewriter Very was... Very gregarious. Yes, his typewriter was maybe just a minute away from mm. him, wherever he was. Uh, but his writing room, for example, in later years, looked directly on Ujuelegba Road. Mm. With all the noise and whatever, uh, the day I asked, I said, how do you write in the midst of all this chaos? He said, come and experience it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I followed him. We went upstairs and he shut the window and he started walking. And then he asked me, he said, mm. where is the noise? I said, yeah, but there's still a lot of chaos. He said, yeah, there's chaos out there, but we're not getting it here. Then when he wants to excite himself a little bit, he will pull the curtain and then he will say, say, have you seen that boy? He's been standing there for two hours. He's not a commuter. He's not going anywhere. He said, maybe, maybe he's a pickpocket. Let's see what's going to happen. And we'll be there for the next one hour. Amazing. Just, and I wonder, I'll say, wow, this is how he writes his Absolutely. books. And at this time I, I, I'm, uh, I'm telling you about, he was, we were pushing him to write his memoirs. Uh, and it became more urgent. Mm. I think it was in 1998. Uh, we went to Germany together and we got to a hotel. Uh, as soon as we checked in, we, then the following morning we came downstairs for breakfast and I collected egg and bacon and whatever. And suddenly there was a queue leading to our table. So he said, Ah, I disavow another thing here. <laughs> I said, Chief, it's probably you. He said, Me, who am I? They were all looking for autographs. Amazing. And um, <laughs> we, we, we don't have that much time left, uh, George, but did he write primarily for Nigerians? I mean, obviously, his fame went beyond Nigeria, was, but was his main audience Nigerians, would you say? Yes. It's mainly Nigerians. In the city he wrote about, uh, all the books he wrote while he was in the North growing mm. up, uh, uh, a password of Malam Elia, Africanized Entertainment, which obviously is one of my favorite, mm. what you were asking, Story of Vengeance. Then when he moved to the West, that's when he started doing the people of the city, mm. uh, uh, Jaguanana, and the kind of things. Mm. You know, glittering City is actually Lagos. You know, so it was mainly for Nigerian or worldwide audience, mm. but painting a picture of Yes. Africa mm. post-colonial. Yes, communicating Africa to the world, yes, as yes. it were. And, and these two books here, I understand they are my copies. Yeah, these are your copies, <laughs> yes. Well, I well, want Already to, autographed and signed by the foundation. Well, I have to say that I'm absolutely honored and delighted. I mean, I'm going to start reading Jaguar Nana again tonight. Yeah. Yes. No question. And I'm somebody who is just... This is brilliant. It's been brilliant. You George... Equency and Wale Olaye, I want to thank two of you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you for having us. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.